the apocalypse has already happened. For anyone who has experienced colonization, we are already living in the post-apocalypse. Life as we knew it has been fundamentally interrupted, devastated, and shifted. Rather than asking what is yet to come, we are living it now, with the focus shifting from how to survive in an imagined future to how to thrive in the moment for the sake of a better future. Right now, we are living in the midst of a climate crisis. All life is connected and we are all affected from waters that are unsafe to drink because they are unable to cleanse themselves when they can't freeze over, to maple trees that drip sap early for too short of a season due to rapidly fluctuating unpredictable weather, to flowers vital to bees that face a harsh surprise when ice unexpectedly hits after they have arrived. With the onslaught of the pandemic, there is expanded global awareness regarding the impact of industry on the land, waters, and skies. The fallacy of access to food and medicines, and the value of working together for collective well being. Through all of this, there is hope. We can look to those who came before us to help inform our actions right now for the next generations. Indigenous ways of knowing, such as teachings of collaboration, reciprocity, and balance, traditional ecological knowledge, and food sovereignty offer insights into restoration. Across all, they provide design inspiration for games that face current crises with solutions. Along the River of Space Time is a virtual reality game. It opens within a wigwam and asks you to look up to the sky. With your attention and focus and care on looking to the stars, you can form a constellation. While around you, 360 footage of real world environments across lands and waters that change seasonally, reveal florals that grow in as you participate in the healing of the land and hear water teachings in my language on Shamon. What is so vital about the experience that I had with developing this game is that there were certain shots that I wanted of an ice cave that happened years ago and I was never able to get with a 360 camera for this particular game because the weather was never the same again. The ice never fully formed. The changes were constantly fluctuating. Flowers grew in and then snow would fall and they would die. Over the last few years working on this, I've seen it myself. I've walked this land regularly and witnessed how climate change has had an impact on how the waters turn themselves and how we move across this land. <laughs> On our water is a singing game. And in this, there's this sense of hope because the Oshkikijik singers and Elder Sharon Day, as well as elders who collaborate with the Oshkikijik singers passed on water songs in Anishalmon to be shared with all people. So these were songs that were written specifically to be passed on. You were in 
invited to sing in Anishamon as well as understand the phrases and the teachings that come with them. To learn about the water walkers and to understand the importance that water has, not just for our bodies and for the waters themselves, but for all interrelated life. And along with this comes a very particular mechanic in which there is no judgment from the game. There is no feedback system. You are invited into a safe space to sing, perhaps where no one can hear you, or not sing at all, just listen and interact with the language in a way that shows you the roots of the phrases and relays the teachings that come with understanding water songs. And within this is the teaching that competition does not always need to be against one another, that it can be within our own selves. That as we improve ourselves, anyone in parallel with us will rise as we rise. Monomonike is a motion game in which you walk into a wigwam within a museum space. You listen there to teachings about monomen, wild rice, and what has happened as the waters have shifted as the seasons change rapidly and unexpectedly, wild rice struggles to grow. And in addition to that, there are people that go out on the waters and they beat the rice down because they are impatient and they are trying to gather as much as they can, as speedily as they can. And when you do this, it damages the stalks, not just for right now, but potentially for many, many years, or it can actually kill off the plant. And so the irony of this game is that you go into this space and right away it's telling you knock the rice, and to do that, you move your arms. But if you move really fast and you move really rapidly, it will not let you progress to the next level. Instead, it tells you, knock the rice gently. And until you slow down in that space and move your arms in a more precise manner to aim directly at the rice and knock it gently, you will not be able to move forward. In this way, you are being taught not just about proper gathering practices, but respect for food that food is not just here for us to consume or to turn into money as a value, but rather our foods are life as well and it is important to respect them and understand how we interact with them for the sake of not just ourselves, but for the next generations and for all life that didn't relate. The Gift of Food is a board game which passes on very similar teachings from a Northwest Coastal perspective. This game involves mechanics like collaboration and respect for the foods, as well as balance. You are intended to monitor your well-being as well as a basket of foods and you have to balance how many different kinds of foods and medicines you have. Some of these you use for yourself and some of these you keep in the basket for the end of the game in which you are challenged to see how much you can give back to community through potlatch. At the end of the game, the person who has the most variety of foods and medicines to provide to the community is the winner. If you were someone who thought you would try to get the most of something, you're actually going to lose. What matters most is that you have a good variety and that you are balanced in your approach. You also have the opportunity through all of the challenges that you face along the way during the game to be a steward of the land 
And when you do this, it will give you a bonus that provides to you more foods and more medicines. And this might look like burning land so that for the next season, you know, there will be more plants that will grow in. It might look like being mindful of how much you take when you're out gathering or how much you hunt. In this way, the value of balance is reinforced, particularly in the wind condition, but also as people are playing. I've seen players be really funny in this game together where uh, one instance there was an auntie who decided she was gonna take all of one of the foods throughout the whole game. And they had all gathered together and they all had food that they were sharing. And so after the game ended, you know, no kidding, they all got around and this auntie was gonna go around during the potluck and take other people's food for real, for real. And no one would let her because she hadn't shared in the game. <laughs> and she ended up with only a plate of, you know, what she had brought herself for that potluck. And so it was interesting to see how within the game, those teachings can be reinforced within community and players as well. In Gathering Native Foods, which is a suite of mini games, you can dig for clams, you can pick blackberries, you can catch salmon, or you can choose to step out of gameplay and listen to stories and songs that relate to the foods that are shared through this game. You learn about how the land has changed and how the waters have changed and how the seasons have changed because of the impact of colonization and its long lasting effect of climate crisis. And you are challenged to think about gameplay, not just in regards of we've got to grab it, grab it, grab it, take it, take it, take it, get all the points you can, but rather there's a randomized system that tells you exactly how many salmon you are supposed to catch for an instance of gameplay. And if you win or lose is not based on you being able to complete the total number and even exceed the total number, but in fact, being very careful with how you catch fish. If you catch too many, you lose the game. And this is because we have to think in ways that are restorative and sustainable and can be passed on. And one of those practices is really interrelated with not taking more than you need and really thinking about the next generations of all forms of life, not just yourself. When Rivers for Trails brings together these different design aspects, it happens at a very important moment of industrial expansion in the 1890s when railroads were putting in just crisscrossing all over the United States. And indigenous communities were being uprooted all over and displaced there was an incredible amount of forced movement and what was referred to as land allotment in which the government came in, divided up land into plots in order to take what was the land that could best be hunted on, fished on, uh, that could grow foods. And they took all of that land for themselves under the guise of splitting up land among uh, a reservation, among the community. And they sold the surplus or they took it for themselves. And they also then forced people in all sorts of directions. And so when Rivers Were Trails has an interface that actually expresses those brown lines there as all of the real world railroad stations and railroad lines that were going in during this time. It's a realistic map that you have to progress through and shifts our understanding of land because you never actually see the names of states within the game. You only ever see the names of what were, you know, declared the reservation titles. And as you interact with characters, you learn about if those names are actually accurate 
or not. You have to balance your well-being, your foods, and your medicines. And we carry with us teachings that foods are medicines, but there are distinctions in terms of how we actually use medicines and different forms of protocol. And so all along the way, there are challenges to gift. There are opportunities to share or to show respect by listening to elders or by other community members that you come along across your journey. All throughout, you learn about different foods and different medicines, not just in relation to their properties of their uses, but what memories they invoke. What are the meanings that they carry with them? Because again, like water and like the lands themselves, plants are also a form of being and they're interconnected, not just as something that we take for energy, but are interrelated. In this way then, you can make offerings of a sama, meaning tobacco, and that helps you during hunting to gain a better yield. There are ways in which we can actually integrate indigenous ways of knowing into the mechanics such that it very smoothly works its way through the system. In When Rivers Were Trails, there's actually a hidden honor system. And so your patience when fishing or the way in which you interact with other people determines an underlying system of how much honor you have. And that honor actually impacts the story that you see as you travel along the way in your journey. And it also affects how you are remembered because regardless of what path you take, the end result of the game is in fact that you have passed on only because that will happen to someone eventually. This isn't meant to encapsulate a person's lifetime and how they are remembered is dependent on what kinds of actions you took and were they honorable. In Thunderbird Strike, which is a side scroller in the reverse direction, you play as a Thunderbird striking lightning down at mining company buildings and the big giant mining trucks. The reason for this gameplay is a direct response to the impact of oil industry. In addition to that kind of destruction that you can get points for, there's also actually the option to strike lightning down at the bones of caribou, wolves, and buffalo to revive them and bring them back to life, as well as people to activate them into action. You can all also gather the people that are walking and standing with you in this, stating through Dylan Miner's art, no pipelines on indigenous lands. There are ways in which we can show the importance of paying attention to the impact that industry has on climate through gameplay that does not need to overtly express those particular teachings, but tells a story and pulls people in with the fun of blasting lightning. In Thunderbird Strike, you always win. This is a design decision that can be critiqued on the end that, well, what's the purpose of the end game if you can always win, no matter what? And for me, as Anishinaabe Kwe, I wanted a game that I could always win, especially with all of the issues that we face, the mounting pressures. It is okay for a game to be there as a safe space to build morale, to draw attention, and to spark conversations. However, it is also done with balance in mind. If you do not kill the pipeline snake at the end yourself, it will eventually deconstruct on its own. 
And while you, as a thunderbird, have one, oil pours itself into the waters and darkens them. And is that the future we want to continue to have? In this way, throughout all of these games, there are different approaches to really orchestrate the use of mechanics for the purpose of relaying teachings that can inform how we address climate crisis. Hopefully some of these have been an inspiration, a way to look at design from a unique lens, and a way in which we can think about games as, again, ultimately what they are here for, which is to be a safe space from which to express ourselves. Miigwech. Thank you.